COVID pandemic, we had to basically put last year's event on hold and, and push it into 2021. So as we all know, lots have happened over the past year. And in some ways, this um, series of panels and a webinar and keynote speakers was intended to try to deal with the here and now, which is to say there's an acceleration in terms of people's use of technology, glitches that I'm learning to deal with, as are some of the people. And um, of course, the pandemic, which has created havoc on a lot of people's lives, some who are no longer with us, some who are still struggling dealing with this. We're talking about digital strategies uh, for artists to reach a diverse audience. And in many ways, you can make the argument that um, BIPOCs, as that term is now becoming an in vogue expression, are affected more so than others. It's, it's really a triple whammy, not just in terms of health issues, but job issues. And of course, the one we're talking about most today, the whole technology and the acceleration of the technology and the, the, the fact that for the most part, we are not there. And that's a big concern. Um, that's something that I know that um, will be addressed. And so at this point, let me just introduce all the panelists um, who are here with us today. And we really want to thank you guys for being a part of this discussion, because I think it's timely and important. Um, I will start with um, Chanel McFarlane. And Chanel is a certified career strategist, a TEDx speaker and writer. And you may have seen her quite a bit on your television sets. It's <laughs> not an accident. It's well-deserved. <laughs> and um, next we have Nikita. And Nikita is uh, Nikita Waugh, I believe is how it's pronounced. Please correct uh, me. It's, it's actually Waugh. Waugh, it's OK. Yeah. Thank and, you. And Nikita's got an MBA in social data analytics. Uh, she's uh, an instructor at OCAD University. She's had a lot of um, early career success running her own businesses. <laughs> and so that's an interesting thing we can explore as well. But she also has this worldview about the importance of mastering digital marketing and social media marketing. And she teaches that as well at, at OCAD. Um, next up, we have Belinda Brady, who wears several hats. I've known Belinda for a long time and uh, she's an artist in her own right and has toured the world with a number of famous stars, including Shaggy, um, among others. And she runs her own company. She also does digital marketing and she's an instructor um, here in Toronto. And, um, you know, she's an all around um, warm person, very giving, very knowledgeable as well. So uh, there you have it. And then we have um, the person who wanted to be last um, <laughs> in terms of the, uh, the, the uh, introductions here. And I'm talking about Mark Good. He's the, uh, he's the owner of Rayarch, and it's a company that has a focus on helping small businesses, um, particularly, the, particularly businesses from, um, you know, the BIPOC community succeed in the online space. So I think it's fair to say that we have quite a bit of firepower here, and um, uh, I see... Nikita smiling as if she's ready to go, but um, <laughs> let's start with the way we introduced everybody. And let me start with, um, with Chanel. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I'll start with Chanel is because she's had a lot of practice of being on television. And although this is not <laughs> a broadcast, um, I wanted to have her um, you know, begin to talk about her presentation the topic at hand is digital strategies uh, for artists and other mm -hmm. creatives um, to reach a diverse audience, something that we all need, including ourselves as the organizers 
of this conference. So mm -hmm. take it away, Chanel, and uh, then we'll go to Nikita afterwards. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Phil, uh, for the introduction. It's a pleasure to be here uh, and to share my experiences. I do have a bit of a presentation that I'd love to share, but of course, want to make it very interactive if there's any questions. So I'll just go ahead and I just tried to share my screen. I don't have the ability. Um, I don't know if you have that and just give me those quick permissions and I'll get that up there. Um, but really just wanted to take some time to walk through some examples specifically from the music industry um, that I really admired in terms of them you know, getting success during this time, building their personal brands and some of the key lessons um, that we can take from that. I'm just not sure, are we good there or do you want me to continue? If you can please continue for yeah, that. You know, no we'll problem, no that. problem. So just to give a bit of background, although uh, Phil did a great uh, quick introduction to, to who I am. So I do have a background in digital marketing and content strategy. And that's really where um, most of my expertise is in terms of supporting education and retail and financial tech and a variety of different industries. Um, but really where my passion lies is once I launched my own blog in 2016, um, as a way to just put myself out there and see what opportunities um, can come from that, um, I really, I'm really someone that can speak to how you can basically start from nothing, you know, having no audience, and how you can leverage digital tools to build an international audience. And I think right now, especially when, of course, we're all virtual during the pandemic, we don't have the ability to meet in person and travel as we used to, uh, using digital tools are obviously very, very important. And so over the last several years, I've been able to use tools like social media and of course more recently PR and using TV opportunities as a way to continue to get my expertise out there. Um, but I believe that you know right now is really the best time to build an online brand and even though it may seem like yes you know the world is uncertain and you know there's so many different social media platforms now of course there's TikTok, there's Clubhouse, all the platforms are changing all the time it can feel really overwhelming to people. Um, and most times when I talk to people about personal branding, they're like, well, you know what? This is too overwhelming for me. And the platforms are changing too much. Or the other thing is that they feel as though there's no room for them online. You know, there's people that are that, that have been on there forever. There's different topics. There's so many creators online. And so people are a little bit confused as to how they can actually go about um, getting their space on the internet. And I believe there's room for everybody on the internet. And as we've seen, of course, during the pandemic, we're all home. Online engagement has actually been at an all time high, right? People are spending time on platforms like Spotify, like TikTok, of course. And, you know, they're downloading music. There's YouTube all the social media platforms, that engagement is at all time high and I don't see that changing anytime soon, right? So now really is the opportunity to really leverage those tools and get yourself out there. And especially if you're someone that's just getting started, you may not have the budget to, you know, have your own publicist or have your own marketing teams like some people do. There's actually a lot of things that you can actually do um, on your own. And so a few examples that I've really admired actually uh, throughout the pandemic, um, of course, I'm sure people may remember at the start of the pandemic, there was DJ D Nice who was doing these, you know, virtual parties on Instagram stories. And I remember I loved tuning in. It was really great. Um, and that's a really great example of somebody that, you know, of course, he was a DJ, I'm sure made a career of traveling and hosting at parties and being in person. And then all of a sudden the world shuts down. Well, what do you do? And he used the tools at his disposal. Instagram Live is free to use. He was streaming his sets for free. And everybody from, I think, Michelle Obama to Joe Biden, people from all different walks of life are tuning in. And I personally know that something is really taking off. And I get a text from my mom like, hey, have you heard of this DJ D-Nice? That's how I always know that something is really taking off. And that really shows you the diversity of the audience that he was able to get. And hundreds of thousands of people were able to tune in to his Instagram Live. So that's a really, really great example. The other example, of course, is the video I'm sure a lot of us have seen from TikTok, you know, the guy that was on his skateboard and sipping on his cranberry juice and just kind of giving us this inside look um, into his morning vibe. Um, and that video is really interesting for a number of reasons. Of course, he's not a musician, just, you know, your regular average guy just on his skateboard enjoying his cranberry juice. But what was really amazing to see was the impact that it had on, you know, Fleetwood Mac song Dreams. I mean, it went back to the Billboard charts, I think after 43 year absence, I believe it was like hundreds of streams, making tons of money. Of course, the creator, Nathan, I believe his name was, you know, made tons of money from that. 
Um, so that's another example of just showing how you can use a tool like TikTok and how musicians can really benefit um, from using that tool if they're open to it. And another example that I actually really liked, uh, there's another DJ, I believe he goes by Amorphous. You know, he's been sharing his sets for free on Twitter and on Instagram. And it's been interesting as well to see um, the impact that he's been able to have. You know, we've released a single, I believe, with DJ Khaled and Fat Joe, um, and it has been on the charts as well. And these are just, you know, average people that are just using the tools that are at their disposal. So some of the lessons that I feel, you know, that we can take from that in terms of a personal branding perspective, First is to just always have your personal branding essentials set up. And I'm a big advocate for that. And first that starts with getting all of your social profiles and ensuring that you have those actually reserved in your name. You're consistent across different profiles. So you don't wanna have you know, one username for Instagram and then a completely different username for Twitter. You wanna make it easy for people to find you and connect with you because if they're finding you on a social media platform or they stumble on your music, they're probably gonna to wanna to find and connect with you on social media. And then from there, just having the essentials, like a great bio, um, you know, having a website set up, even if it's one page, that can go a really long way because you can have the bio there, some great photos, having a press kit, of course, having the links to your music, all of those things are really key personal branding essentials so that you don't miss out on any opportunities. The second thing I would say is just being open to different marketing strategies, right? So using TikTok, we talked about TikTok, that's driving music discovery right now because people are, you know, they're scrolling on TikTok, they stumble on a song for a few seconds and they're like, oh, hey, I like this, this is great. You know, let me go to Spotify or Apple Music or whatever the platform is, listen to the full song. Then maybe they're gonna go over and they're gonna follow you on social media. That's sort of what that journey looks like now. And so keeping that in mind uh, when you're thinking about different ways to share your music. Um, and then, of course, brand partnerships. That's another way that's really great. And we've seen a lot of musicians leverage that now because, of course, they can't really take advantage of concerts in other ways they would have used before. But brand partnerships are a really great way to get in front of a diverse audience. If you think about, you know, the brands uh, that your audience uh, likes and enjoys, how can you get in to partner with those brands and leverage their audience and really build a mutually beneficial relationship? The last thing I will say uh, before we um, wrap up is really just getting into um, the, and so we talked about the, uh, the personal brand essentials, we talked about the marketing strategies, but then third, telling your story, right? Always telling your story. So people want to connect with you on social media, you know, finding other things that you can share beyond your music. People want to connect with people. People want to know your story. So finding ways to do that. And then also PR opportunities, right? There's always blogs, there's magazines, there's so many different opportunities to get your story out there. And so I encourage people to follow journalists on Twitter. That's a really great way to get yourself included in different blogs and articles. Um, and so that's a really great thing that you can do. Journalists are always posting and saying, hey, you know, I'm writing this story. Um, you know, I'm looking for a few people to talk to. So if you're ever wondering how people get those mentions in newspapers and articles, that's simply how they do it. They're just connected with the right people on social media. And then another free platform that I'll share uh, for those interested is Help a Report Porter Out. So again, you know, if you're wondering how, how do people get in Forbes or those big outlets, it's simply by subscribing to a free tool like Help a Reporter Out. You sign up, you get, you get the emails, you can say what industries that you're interested in. So you can sign up for entertainment and media, for example. And then you get emails three times a day from journalists that are looking for people to include in their stories. It's as simple as that. You don't need to have your own PR person to be able to do that. Um, and so I encourage everybody, if that's sort of the coverage that you're looking for, that's a great tool uh, to leverage. So that's it for me. You know, I'm open to any questions, but just really quickly wanted to share some tools and uh, share some tips and tricks that you can use, especially if you're getting started and working on your own. All right. Well, we're off to a great start. And thank you, Chanel. Mm -hmm. And Absolutely. Um, I will move to Nikita next. And uh, mm -hmm. again, uh, we'd love to have you share your insights and any other thing that you want to present. Thank you, Chanel, and thank you, Phil, for your kind words. I'm actually trying to share my screen. Um, it seems to be enabled, but I don't think, okay, I think I'm going to just be wing it in. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much, and a very good afternoon uh, to all the attendees. I'll also be talking about uh, digital strategies, but I have a more tactical approach. Absolutely love the examples from Chanel and I could recognize one or two, not every everything, but they were so bang on. Um, so I'd like to begin with the elephant in the room, 
what are the things that the pandemic has changed? We're going to take like a second to think about it. And if you're thinking, Nikita, it's everything. Well, I agree, it's everything. The way we interact, the way we are living today, our routines, our lives, um, the way we discover products, the way we uh, communicate, the way we engage with people, everything has changed. But some important things haven't. I still feel there are some things that, that the pandemic has not changed. Our values, the way we uh, uh, engage with music, the live uh, music performances, we still like to see those. The example, Chanel gave that uh, DJ example that people uh, tune into. Absolutely, we like live music performances. The power of online streaming platforms. The algorithms haven't changed. In fact, sometimes I feel more than my friends, YouTube knows my music and the, the suggestions that I get from YouTube, they're so spot on. So the algorithms haven't changed. So definitely we can rely on these platforms as musicians, as, as uh, people, as creative professionals from the industry. And we still listen to music. My, I don't commute by subway or, or I might not be driving to my office every day. So it, that doesn't mean I'm missing out on my one hour of music. I still listen to music. I find other ways. I might be waking up early. I might be having a morning routine or morning workout or an evening workout, but I still listen to music. So that hasn't changed. And music is how we heal. It's powerful. It makes an impact. It leaves an impact and music doesn't have a language. So definitely people are finding ways to connect with music. But why is it that we're still having this conversation? It's because the way people are engaging with music is different. The way uh, the, uh, the venue of the audience has changed. Yes, it was, it was there even before the pandemic, but the pandemic has played the role of a catalyst to bring about that change. And that is why the question, why not digital? We need to go digital today. And before we embark on our digital journey, the first thing that we need to understand is what is my objective? Why am I going digital? Am I creating awareness or generating interest or driving that desire towards my brand, my music, my, my skill, talent? Or am I tempting my users to take action? I need to understand what is the IDA? the awareness, interest, desire, and action as fundamental as marketing can get. Once I know what my objective is, that's when my path will be clear. Otherwise, this, this jungle, I call it a jungle of uh, uh, digital strategies and, and this digital world, there's so much out there, we can get lost. That's what I believe and that's what's happening with a lot of creative professionals. We need to know where we are headed. And then we need to know who we are having a conversation with, because in the digital world, it's a two way highway. It's not a broadcast where, you know, I'm just going to promote my my brand and I'm going to announce about stuff. No, it's not like that. We need to have engagement. We need to have a conversation. And to have that, we need to know who we are talking to. Right. We need to know their age, their gender, their life phase, uh, the geographic uh, location of, of my audience, if that's relevant. Also, the interests. And if it sounds too intrusive, it's not, it's not. Because think about it. Um, if someone's leaving a comment on my profile, don't I go check that out? No, that's not stalking, that's social media listening. Yes, there's a term for that, that's social media listening. <laughs> so uh, if I am getting to know some who's posting on my, my uh, profile and um, that's me just engaging with my personal profile, think about how many tools and, and how many resources a brand might have. So when I want to know about my audience, that doesn't mean I'm going to manually go and check the thousands of people who are leaving comments. I'm going to use tools. There are so many free tools available like the Facebook Audience Insights. It's a great tool. Yes, it's giving us insights about the Facebook audience, but honestly, it's a very relevant tool if I want to size up my audience. I want to know who's actually engaging with my, uh, uh, who's um, not engaging with my content per se, but who is in my segment? So let's say I want to pick people from Toronto. Let me know what are their interests? Uh, what are the different life phases they're in? Are they married? Are they single? Are they committed? Um, 
which uh, what are their different interests do they like animals do they like certain type of music where do they hang out what type of food do they eat do they follow certain bloggers this is the kind of information facebook can return and once i have this information i can actually have a conversation with my audience right so know my objective know who i'm having conversation with use another tool like uh, facebook business watch now this is if you have a business profile how I wish I could have shared my screen. I have all those tools on screen, but I could put that in the comment box later on when others are speaking without distracting, I promise. Um, so the Facebook Business Watch gives us information about our competitors. Again, we are not spying on them. We are listening to them. This is social media. The data is just available. So we've got to make use of it. Uh, Google Trends, it's another great tool that allows us to know what is trending. For example, there is a jazz festival happening in Toronto and I want to post about it. I want to create, and I'm participating in that. I want to know what's happening at the same time or what are people talking about uh, in Toronto at the same time. Google Trends allows me to do that. And once I get that information, I can use it. I can create a content calendar out of it and, and post. So with so much information, of course, uh, there are two more tools. These are all free tools. And that's how much free tools give us. Think about what free tools will do. So, uh, so if you have a social media profile, of course, use the insights and Buzzsumo, B-U-Z-Z-S-U-M-O. Buzzsumo gives us a lot of free information about what's trending, who's posting, uh, what's the most trending article in a particular industry, influencers, a lot of information. Again, this content, once we know what type of content people are engaging in, I can use the same content for building my brand in the digital world. And today that's what's happening. We need to know what to post. Yes, creating Instagram profile. I know how to do that, Nikita, but what do I do after that? I need to engage with my audience in the language that my audience understands. And that's why we need to use these tools to get to know what they're actually talking about. Then of course, connect with your audience using YouTube, upload videos. Well, one fun fact is that 1 billion hours of videos are watched every day. That's a lot of content that gets consumed. So use YouTube as, as a, a platform where you are sending your audience to uh, listen to music. Of course, do not ignore Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, because these are the platforms to build your audience, engage with your community, observe what your competitors and peers are doing and invest. Please invest a lot of time in creating and editing content. Please do not just, just uh, create uh, a video like this right now and just post it without editing because people like to see on these platforms. And today, um, well, with the pandemic, there's one very important change that has happened in all of us we notice content. We notice content, we notice the clarity, we notice the, the acoustics of that content, we notice everything about content. So as creative professionals, we really need to invest in the quality of content that we are posting. Connect with your audience using Spotify. Now Spotify has this fun feature where if you are not a part of a label, you are an independent artist, you get to, uh, you get to place your, um, you get to place your, the word is the song or, or the music that you, uh, you can pitch it to Spotify. You can pitch it to Spotify and get it into the editorial playlist. Please excuse me, English is my second language. Uh, so uh, upload it into the editorial playlist. And by doing that, one way is, uh, one way this tactic is going to help you as an artist is people will get to notice you. And of course, Google you. So they're going to uh, check out your digital brand. So what does this mean? All these tactics that we are engaging in are building, uh, building our brand in the digital world. We are a brand in ourselves. We are our personal brands. So we also need to check up what comes up when I punch in Nikita Wag for myself, whatever your name is, just punch in your name and uh, check the Google results. What are those results? That's what we have to work on today. That's what people are looking for. Of course, use TikTok as well. TikTok, um, the latest fixation, as I call it. Make your music available, not just, yes, you have, uh, you have the flair for acting and drama and you are excellent with the videos. Go ahead, upload those. 
But another way of monetizing this platform, monetizing in, the, in terms of digital currency is make your music available and, and enjoy the benefits of earned content. Earned content, when people are going to share content using your music, well, you are becoming a name in the digital world. And of course, people are going to go looking you up on Google again. That's where the digital brand fits in the digital puzzle. Connect with your audience through word of mouth, ask for shares, mention other people, connect with influencers. I think Chanel covered that really well, so I'm not going to talk about that, but it'll be repetition otherwise. Um, Oh, and finally, send your audience to a destination and track, track, track everything out of it. <laughs> the website, use uh, uh, SoundCloud as a great platform for uploading uh, content. CD Baby, if you are an independent artist, I think CD Baby and TuneCore are great platforms for not only hosting your content, but also monetizing it. Because the number of times people listen to your content and download it, well, you are paid. Yes, so uh, while we are strategizing and building our digital brand and um, channelizing our energies on all these platforms, name, namely Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, Facebook, all the different uh, social platforms, send your audience to one of these platforms where you can monetize it as well. Like I said, when I started, it's a very tactical presentation that I have. And finally, I'm going to summarize by saying, Nikita, all this is a lot of work. I know that's why we have platforms like Sound Better to, to get help from pros. And if you're saying, but Nikita, I'm a startup. I might not have that kind of budget and I hear you too. There are interns everywhere. There are so many colleges in Toronto and all over Canada. And there are people looking for experience. So many film schools. I, th I think there's also Toronto Film School and there's Vancouver Film School. And there are so many more in the US as well. There are so many, and I say film school because these students also learn about music there. So um, all these uh, schools, these uh, students need experience. Hire them as interns, delegate. Delegate is the way to go forward in the digital economy today. I cannot be a master of everything today. I need to learn the art of delegating my tasks and focusing my creative energies to building my brand. And to summarize, size up your audience, create your calendar. And by calendar, I mean not my appointments calendar, my content calendar. Schedule my content using a content management tool like Loomly or Later or Buffer. These are free tools. There are so many more uh, premium tools like Hootsuite with uh, advanced social data uh, features. Engage with your community and digital community as well. Predominantly digital, please. Have conversations and listen. Listen to your competitors, listen to your peers. What are they talking about? What are the content people are engaging with? Make use of marketing tools. There are so many marketing, niche marketing tools for musicians. Delegate tasks. And I had a beautiful quote by Nikita Wag, which I cannot share, but I'm going to say it. Don't forget to tap your toes and sing to your heart's tune while waltzing through the digital ecosystem. Because at the end of the day, you're building yourself here. That's it. Thank you, Nikita. And um, delegate, delegate, delegate. That yes. appeals to me. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to say because it's so much work to do. Yes. Um, which brings us to Belinda, a lady who does it all. Um, and uh, Belinda also teaches at Harris, I believe. Your, your microphone is off. Yes, I teach at Harris at the moment. And she's an artist. Uh, she runs her own business as well. So this is a great example of someone who has to multitask. And um, as Nikita says, she's had to learn the art of delegating too. So. Yes. <laughs> At this point, take it away, Belinda, and uh, it's your turn to share some insights. Thanks for having me, Phil and Donna. It's, it's really a pleasure to be amongst these superstars here on the panel. So um, very, very honored to be here. Uh, hello, everybody out there in internet land. I know that we have some people from Toronto and all over the world. So thanks for joining us at this time. 
Uh, so just to give you some background, I started out uh, as a recording artist and dancer in a, a production company called Jamaica Musical Theater Company. And that's from Jamaica. And uh, that's where I, I started as a very young artist, singing, dancing, acting. And moving on from there, I decided that, yes, this is what I wanted to do um, professionally. Um, fast track, I got the opportunity to work with Shaggy and I toured um, Europe with him. I did a couple of TV shows uh, in North America and um, that was really fascinating. Did a couple of videos and choreographed as well, the dancing and um, worked with a couple of people as well as Julian Marley, um, Omi, uh, Sly and Robbie, and uh, to name a few, I was quite honored to work with these artists who taught me so much about the music business and um, what it took to get there. And uh, as a young, naive artist, I was just, yeah, man, just get that demo and just send it in and ready. And no, it wasn't that easy. Uh, I sent in a couple of demo demos, even to Virgin Records at the time Shaggy was with, and uh, heard a lot of no's, not just from them, but from Canada and even the States. And uh, that, those are the days when demos were, were supposed to be what got you through the door. Unfortunately, my experience was not that. And so I decided to flip the script a bit and I said, you know what? I don't need the record labels. I can do this independently. Uh, having the personality that I do, I went and I learned everything I could learn about music production, songwriting, marketing, and the rest of it. So I decided to go to a school called Harris Institute for the Arts, back then it was called, and now it's called Harris Harris Institute, where I studied producing and engineering. I decided to work in a radio station because I said, well, I have to get my song on the radio, so I have to learn how the radio station work. Then I decided I have to learn to get my music, my, get on much music. So I did a little stint promotion with them. So as the artist, I decided I just needed to work with everybody. And um, that's, that's how I decided that I want to be consciously an independent artist because I need to learn everything that entails in getting the music out there. Um, so I created my own, my own company called Bun Down 360. And that was uh, my recording studio. Back in the day, I was uh, in the recording studio doing a session and uh, the pot was boiling over and my client said, Belinda, I think you should call your, your, your company Bondo and so on. And that's where the name came about. But the 360 was, I'm going to start here. I'm going to do whatever it takes. I'm going to come right back to being an artist. So what did I do? I went and I studied and I, I, I went back to school. I did the engineering program. And then I went and I did my uh, continued school. I did my MBA with a focus on uh, marketing and project management. And I came back and now I'm um, doing, uh, I, I pretty much live in the internet world. I'm uh, working with uh, internet companies, uh, marketing companies, radio stations, and, and the re so many. And you know what? I'm living my passion right now. And I think that's really what I wanted to get across today is that you have to, remember why you're doing what you're doing and to, to do it with passion. And I decided if I'm going to work and make money, I have to make sure that I'm doing it with passion. So here's what's happening. Um, I decided to change my whole ecosystem and I'm going to, I decided I'm going to make money from it as well. Uh, so now I have created my own teaching academy where I teach singing. And that's how I monetize as an artist. I teach singing as well as I teach young and upcoming aspiring artists and I consult them uh, what it takes to do well in the music business. I echo a lot of what these ladies say today, which is you got to have a strategy. What is the objective? The objective is you want to be, um, you want to be making money. You want to have your music out there. You want to have a large following. You want to develop an email list, which is my main objective. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. By the way, I'm not watching the time field, so please stop me because I could go on and on. <laughs> I'll, I'll give you a hint. How's Thank that? <laughs> And uh, so what, what is happening now is that um, by teaching at Harris and teaching the upcoming artists, I teach them uh, how to um, uh, leverage the internet as uh, whether they're managers, producers, songwriters, 
um, and, a, and a recording artist. Now there's a the buzzword out there called artistpreneur. I recognize myself and identify myself as an artistpreneur. What is that? I'm not just a musician, a songwriter, a producer, a melody maker. I'm also a marketer. Because if you're an independent artist, you have to understand the business of marketing and the business of music. So yes, I have this down pat the last 20 years of being a musical artist, but no, how am I going to mend the two or blend the two? So um, what, what, what I teach them is you gotta understand the tools that are out there, whether it's Facebook, whether it's Google ads, um, and uh, as you know, Google owns YouTube, leveraging YouTube so you can get thousands of views on your, um, on your video, leveraging Spotify, leveraging Instagram. And depending on what the goal is, you have to learn how to drive traffic to wherever you need to drive traffic to. So if the goal is I want more Spotify views, you drive the people to Spotify. If you want to drive people to your website to increase your email list, then you drive the people to your website, right? Um, someone mentioned understanding your audience. It's very essential, essential. I can't tell you enough how it is in, uh, to understand who your audience is, right? Um, back in the day, I, I was so confused as an artist, but I wanted to do rock music. I wanted to do jazz music. I wanted to do reggae music. And those are uh, depending, maybe not so much as now because everybody is so diverse, but they were, it was like, this is the lane for that. This is the lane for that. This is the lane for that. But now it's about psycho, psychographics, you know, like-minded people. Um, they call it the Harley Davidson culture. So you can create micro uh, fan bases or micro audiences that can relate to you. Perhaps somebody liked this jacket and they would probably like reggae as well. Or maybe somebody likes curly hair so they'll probably use this hair product, right? So it's all, this is the business part of it that we have to kind of understand and understand who your target market is from the demographic, their age group, the male and female, um, you know, what's their income? Are they going to school? Do they own a home? What about geography? Where are they from? Are they in Italy, Africa, Jamaica, or Canada? Are they, um, are they buying the same jacket? You know, that sort of thing. Are they listening to the same music? And, you know, it, it's really important to understand that. So therefore, um, going back to Facebook, when you create that Facebook um, persona, audience persona, then you can know that you can have 3 million or 300,000 in this area, this area, and this area. And it can help you to determine the type of budget, if you do have a budget, to market to your audience. And these are the sort of things I do as a recording artist. Now, aside from the clients that I work with is, I understand who my audience is, that I can market to them. But also accepting and realizing that in order to do well in this industry, you have to sort of pull up your socks a little bit. And um, I was so busy doing marketing for other people and music and this and that. I, I decided in this pandemic, it was an opportunity to start the focus again. And so I now have a team of people that I work with who helps me to market online, helps me to I have a production team, I have a social media team, um, and I have a blog team. And it's really forming your ecosystem. And that's what I have done as an artist. I formed an ecosystem. I now have a, a video videographer. We're going to be doing series every week because the objective is grow the social media following, increase the email list so I can remarket to them and monetize, right? For example, if I have a, a hat or a paraphernalia with my brand, I can remarket. So let's say I have 100,000 people on my list. I can remarket to them and sell to them every month, right? And then uh, let's say 10% of that would be great income. So the idea is for me to grow my list, grow my social media following. So that's my entire year. I know that I have to release music within this quarter, this quarter, this quarter. I'm going to distribute it from TuneCore, which I use now. People use DistroKid depending because of the what they offer. I, I, I've been putting it out on Spotify, but I have actually been levering the platforms and working with them together from the YouTube to the Facebook, to the Instagram, to the Spotify, creating your list of um, Spotify playlists, right? 
and making sure that um, you're always outreaching, you're always having conversations, and you're available to speak to people, to your fans. Because as an independent artist, it's such a grassroots um, level that you have to be available. And if you're not available, there's so many distractions, they're gonna shift over to somebody else. So that's my world and uh, that's, that's what I do as a recording artist and it's, it's, it's continuing um, and I'm learning every day. I'm taking courses every day even. I'm upgrading my Google certifications. I go and get the free courses on Facebook. I go and get the free courses for blogging or SEMrush.com is another website I go to if you want to learn strategy strategies if you don't have the budget you can use organic strategies to get the word out there but what i must tell everybody is by taking all this information that we're all giving to you it's about uh having your objective putting a strategy together when you put the strategy you make sure that you know who your audience is and then execute using the tools that are out there and then of course monetizing you can do it but you have to have some kind of analytics whether it's google analytics whether it's facebook analytics whether it's youtube analytics to see how well your campaigns are performing once you understand that, you can make better decisions to say, this is working, cut, this is working, great, add more money or more energy. This is not working, let's move on. And that's now become my world as an artistpreneur. All right, thank you very much, Belinda. And um, we're getting lots of great information thus far. And uh, Mark, I hope you're ready because the bar has been set really high uh, my brother, I know you wanted to be last, so you got to hit it out of the park. Well, I'm definitely going to sound very redundant <laughs> Here's, because I'm on the same page with many of the panelists. Well, underscoring it always has its advantages in case people weren't paying close attention. So I think there's value to that. And um, we can have a conversation afterwards. So please feel free to change it up if you must. But underscoring it, I think we all agree there's value to that. Definitely, All right. definitely. So please take it away. No problem, no problem. Okay, well, well, thanks for inviting me, Phil, including me as well as Donna. My, my background initially, um, I specialize in technology. I'm working with small businesses, helping them grow and succeed online. But how I got into technology was actually through music, right? So basically, uh, my brother was a DJ when I was younger. He rented me the ASR 10, if anybody knows about it. And I got into producing that way, but it was highly technology based and I loved music. And then later I got into computer engineering. But the challenge that I had when I first started was uh, in post-secondary education, I had a de decision to make. I'm gonna go the music route, which is very social. You feel very connected with people or I'm gonna go the technology route, was, which was more certain and the revenue was a little bit more a, a straight dotted line, like a straight line in terms of revenue. And I chose technology, but throughout my whole time, I actually felt that um, I always wondered about what if, if I put my all into music, right? So coming back here full circle and talking about online strategies post pandemic and relating it to music is very therapeutic to me because I'm kind of, it's like the best of both worlds. It's like coming full circle, as we say exactly as Belinda said, 360. That's how I feel, right? So the, the key things that I wanted, I wanted to talk about initially on my presentation was um, the number one thing was, although I'm focusing on small businesses, artists treating their, their, their career like a business and having a business mindset. So one of the things that I was gonna talk about on the presentation is that your brand is you and you don't have to feel like you have to express yourself in one, channel or another. So the artist that, 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 I, that I work with is C. Wavy. He's from Brampton. It actually is actually from Mississauga. And he has very different aspects where he wants to be creative. He's creative in terms of music, but then he also does art as well as does clothing. So it's good that you can express yourself in all these different ways. But what I like about what he's done is that he has a different Instagram account for each because it's not necessarily that all the music people are gonna be into his art. So he might link them every once in a while, but he focuses on the music and then he links to his art and his clothing as well. 
right? And I think it's very important that uh, you have to be creative and I know artists have to be creative or they're gonna go crazy if they're not creative, but also you have your revenue streams because it's very, sometimes it's very difficult to monetize your creativity. And that's what mainly what I, I wanted to speak about. The other thing that I wanted to touch on was um, your competitive advantage. So the same way that I speak to businesses about making sure you have a competitive advantage and discussing what makes you unique from your competition, it's the exact same thing that I feel in terms of dealing with artists as well. Your competitive advantage is your uniqueness. And I think the industry, there's a trend in the industry where you have to do what's working. So even your, your manager or the record label might tell you what's doing, what's, I want you to do what's working. And that's where you kind of want to get to a point where you feel like you can take some creative risk and not always do the exact same thing. So that's the other point that I wanted to talk on. And then also building your online presence. What I feel like uh, in terms of building your online presence is that what you want to do is you have to put yourself in a position where you'd want to, you feel comfortable making it personal. I feel like this generation, especially, they, they want to get into your personal side of things. And it's good that you actually make yourself vulnerable, right? I'm seeing some head nods in regards to that. So uh, when I grew up in the 80s, it was silence. You know, don't, don't share certain things, keep everything private. You want to keep your personal. And now this generation, to actually get buy-in from them, you have to share what you're actually about, right? And also you want to make sure that you're not afraid to be yourself. There's going to be a, there's a tendency, especially if you're in hip hop, that there's this model that you have to follow. And then I think some people have broken that way, like the Drakes and Kanye's where they make themselves a little bit more vulnerable. But I think that's a, a pattern that's actually working. So the next thing that I want to talk about is online presence and especially uh, dealing with artists. It still comes back to great music. And I think the other panelists said this as well with a compelling story, right? And I also was mentioned in terms of Googling yourself to see the strength of your online presence. So I do the exact same thing for small businesses as well, where I've created an automated report that bought small businesses can complete, where it scans the internet and it gives them a score, a rating, almost like a report card on different areas of their online presence. I can put a link in the chat so people can get an idea of what I'm talking about here. Um, but that's what exactly it does. And I think that's a similar thing that artists can do as well to see how their online presence is. But uh, the most important what I think thing that happens that I see is that the artists want to be everywhere. They want to be on all channels. And I believe uh, a popular book, one of the laws is called Concentrate Your Forces from 48 Laws of Power. And it's about intensity beats extensity every time. I never forgot that line. And how I think that relates to music and 40 Laws of Power was a very popular music uh, book among music managers in the hip hop industry is that it's better for you to be thorough on a few marketing channels versus being on every marketing channel and not being present, not being fully present. So I think that's a mistake that I see that happens in business with small business. And I see that mistake happen with artists as well. So it's very important to actually concentrate your forces. And then also that was mentioned that I wanna to touch on is segmenting your audience. So a very popular thing that's been happening in terms of streaming, let's say for example, I, I know artists right now, he has total of half a million streams. That was, what is that? They pays you about 2,500 Canadian. He spent, that, he spent that money on his next video. So you don't wanna just focus 100% on streaming. One thing that you wanna do is make yourself your own website so you can have more control. But I see a lot of artists will they'll say, I don't really need my own website. But I think that's an, another aspect where you can segment your, separate your fans from your supporters. So you have to do that. Your, your fans will listen to your music on streaming. Your supporters might download some exclusive content from your website. And I think you need to reward those supporters because the height of marketing, whether it's artists or small businesses, is when your customers or your fans are doing the marketing and promotion for you because they're so excited about what you're doing. So that's the pinnacle where you want to get to. 
Like if it was the presentation, I would show that diagram where you have that iceberg and you see the iceberg on the top, you only see like 25% of the iceberg, but underneath the iceberg, that's you see 75% of the iceberg is underneath the water. That's what I see when fans are actually sharing their music to their own networks. So I think that's a very important aspect of building your online presence. And I would say that would be the height of it. And then the other thing to touch on for Robert Greene as well, because I just think I see a lot of parallels in his books, is that they say that um, the people that the future of the future is for people that are the most that combine their skills in creative ways to be successful. So that's the future. The people that are combining their skills in creative ways are going to be the most successful. So that's a very important aspect to go for it. And then the last point that I would say that I was going to touch on very important is brand partnerships, because I see a lot of the small businesses I'm working with can benefit with working with artists that match their brand. So ideally, um, artists, sometimes they want to, they're local artists and they want to work with some of the bigger brands, but there's almost, if you have an investor mindset, there's a benefit with working with local brands that you can grow with and kind of do micro marketing, right? And concentrating your forces, even geographically, dominating a certain area and getting well-known and then expanding out from there. And then also using data to see where you're getting traction. So it's not always, you might be getting tra traction in Mississauga, but for some reason you're getting attraction in Atlanta. You need to look at that data to make data-driven decisions the same way I would say for a small business to make data-driven decisions to uh, respond to that and, and at uh, attack that and feed that area more if you're getting popular in Atlanta. So that would be uh, some of the strategies I would say. So mainly you are your brand. You don't have to lock your, yourself down. You can promote your lifestyle and talk about different aspects of your lifestyle if you're into art to get, make a connection kind of multi-threaded with your audience. So I, I think ideally what appeals to me for from a music perspective, because um, back in 2017, I actually created a music competition platform. It was great. Everybody said it was cool, but it wasn't revenue generating. And I the, the business model that I really like for artists in terms of especially affiliated marketing taking off for small businesses is the artist actually partnering with local businesses to, to actually get commission on sales and promote that brand. So I really like that business model. And that's what kind of makes me interested in uh, getting some of the small business I'm working with, getting working with some business minded artists as well. So I feel you're muted. Phil, I think you're muted. Is that any better? Yes. Okay, great. Um, again, we have lots of firepower here. Chanel, um, Makita, Belinda, and Mark. Um, you guys have offered a lot of stuff to, to work with. And um, I wanted to throw some questions out at you. I know Nikita has to head out shortly. So my first question to her is, um, when you're talking about um, marketing to the online world, how much value do you put in having a diverse market as opposed to, you know, having any market, for example? You know, um, some audiences are going to be better fits for your product. And I'm just trying to understand how do you identify what the market is when you are creating a brand online? Yes. So thank you for that question. It's a great question. Um, so once the very first time when I'm going out and launching my brand, I'm going to do a little bit of research on what my competitors are doing, what kind of content they're posting, right? Uh, who's engaging with their brand, and that'll give me, a li I'm not saying that'll give me a very specific idea, but that's going to give me quite a bit of information of, of what to expect when I enter the digital world. 
once I launch my brand and by, by launching tactically, I mean, creating a profile, setting a content calendar and, and um, syncing it, like connecting it with the tool. So tactically, when I do that, when people start engaging with my brand, uh, all of, all of the stuff that I spoke, that was, yes, I spoke that in 10 minutes, but that's something that'll, you know, take months, sometimes even years to happen. Right. So uh, when people engage with my content, that is when the actual social profile analytics will give me a lot of information of who's engaging, where are they from, how much time they're spending, which content they're engaging with. So that's the kind of information I will get at that time. And that I will use to to fine tune my effort. Right. If they're engaging with a certain type of theme, I'm going to do more of that. So that, that's the very beginning. Of course, I can use uh, tools like Hootsuite and Sprout Social. These are social data tools um, that can give me a lot of social data, as in what are the different communities that are engaging? What are their common interests, right? It's not just my in-segment audience, also my affinity and the in-market, as in people who could be my audience in the future, because I just don't want to target who are, uh, for example, I love jazz. I don't have any favorite audience, uh, favorite artist, but it's the it's the type of music I got exposed to recently. I love jazz, but that wasn't my primary music ever, never, right? I I'm an in my I'm uh, an affinity audience there, and I was introduced to it by one of the artists on YouTube. I I was uh, I saw an advertisement and I got exposed to it. So maybe some of my interests, I, maybe I was listening to classical music or I was listening to some kind of other music, which was in the jazz segment. They advertised to me, I got exposed to it. Now I love jazz. So, you know, getting to know your audience is very important and we can do that by actually being on social media. And of course, uh, like Mark said, having your own website where you get to track every little bit out of them. So give them, an, give them an incentive, give them a reason to go there. And just when they visit that, like just by visiting the website, we get their information. So that's very important. Uh, I think Belinda also covered that point, Google Analytics. And it's a free tool. It's a free tool. The demo is free. There are free certifications. All we have to do is invest time. Okay, and on that note, um, let's thank Nikita for this because I thank know she has much. to head off. Thank we you really very much, it's it. wonderful. I learned so much. I think I have put that even in the chat. Thank you for the opportunity, Phil, Donna, and absolutely love the energy, Chanel and Mark and Belinda so much. I got to learn so much from each one of you. Thank you, thank you. I'm thank gonna you, head off and, now. and we'll be in touch. So again, yes. much appreciated and- okay. um, We'll um, continue to ask a few more questions, guys. We're, we're going until uh, 2.30, um, depending on how many questions we're, we're getting back from the audience. So if, if audience members have any questions they want to raise with um, any one of our panelists here, please feel free to um, send that in the chat and um, we'll, uh, we'll ask it of our panelists. Um, so, uh, go ahead and send that to me. Um, I wanted to, um, you know, to talk about something that I think Chanel um, probably has had to deal with because of the nature of her business. Mm -hmm. And that is um, imaging and how you dress, how you present yourself. How important is that? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, we make our impressions of people based on how they look. <laughs> There's no denying that. And of course, you know, we only have a few seconds to make that impression. And I think our style is such a great way to showcase our personality. And so knowing yourself and your brand and the sort of message that you want to communicate, your style is a really great way um, to do that. And of course, you know, I had talked about when you have your social channels and your website and whatnot, the importance of having really great quality photos, giving people a look into who you are. And I love to be able to use clothing for that. Um, but what I also love clothing and just color in general, or just using accessories or whatever it is, 
is that helps to build that brand affinity. People start to associate certain colors or certain things that you wear with who you are. Um, for example, I love you know wearing yellow or you, I'm usually wearing pink or yellow or some form of those colors. And now when I wear those colors, people associate that with me and who I am and the sort of work that I do um, for other artists and for celebrities and whatnot. I'm sure we all have, you know, maybe it's a color, maybe it's a type of hat or jacket, maybe it's sneakers, whatever it is that we associate with particular people. And so use that to your advantage, because again, you want that when people see, um, you know, that particular color, they see that particular hat or pair of shoes that they are thinking of you. You want that to happen. And that's, that's what great branding is, is all about. Okay. Belinda, we know ites, green and gold are normally associated with reggae. Mm -hmm. um, how important is that to how you present yourself? Or is it important at all, a red, green, and gold um, colors? It's, it's not my signature as an artist, but is a, it is a part of my um, cultural brand, if that means anything. Only because I'm from Jamaica and I, and I associate with the culture of Jamaica. So therefore, I may not always have it in my imaging, but it's certainly something that is associated with me for sure. Okay. And Mark, you're currently working with, um, is that a rap artist you mentioned earlier? Yes, C how, Wavy. How important is, you know, how he presents himself? How important is that as a part of his overall brand? Because you gotta know who you, who you are as a brand, right? That's yeah, definitely. Foremost. So yeah. how do you inform him around that question? Well, Primarily, it's um, in terms of his brand. I think he's kind of defining his own brand, but really he wants to distinguish himself from others. That's the most important thing. Definitely in terms of appearance, even has blue, blue dreads, uh, dreads as well. Um, tried to have a uh, shot his first video in Florida as well as Toronto, just to get that dynamic feel. So really distinguishing himself, that's the main aspect of it. But I think the video, the last video that he did where he got the most attraction was most traction, I would say, is because he just he attached himself to a cause. So in, in his come up, he was a victim. His friend was a victim of some gun violence. So he attached himself to the cause of limiting gun violence in, in, in Toronto and told the story in the video. And that got over 100,000 views. And I think when you attach something to, to something that's bigger than yourself, that's where you really, it really connects with people. Again, making yourself vulnerable. So image too as well, but attaching yourself to something greater than yourself. Okay. That's a very good answer because uh, you do see, um, you know, over the years, um, a lot of artists taking the time to identify, you know, something they want to be attached to. You're now seeing that with a lot of NBA players and their foundations um you know giving that vibe of being socially conscious yes. if that's your thing right um you know the thing that jumps out at me hearing you guys speak and you know some of you might be digital natives you know i'm a digital immigrant as the expression goes um it seems like a lot to get done while you're still trying to create art so is there is there a playbook is there step one step two step three how do you try to make sense of you know what clearly is a lot of information that you guys have provided you know is there a one two three step where do you begin mm -hmm, that's that's a really good question i think it starts with starting small right because i think as We've all talked about there are lots of tools, there are lots of platforms to be on, but it's not about being on everything. You can't be on everything and show up on every single platform really well. And so I, I know in my case, I started off really small where I said, you know what, I'm just going to be on Instagram. I'm just going to have my website and that's it. 
over time, you know, I can start to expand. I can maybe start to have more of a presence on Twitter and other platforms, but you are going to burn out really, really fast if you are trying to be on everything. And also your audience may not be on everything, even though it may be tempting to be on every single platform that comes up. I know when Clubhouse came up the other day, I'm like, oh my goodness, that's another platform. You know what? I'm not even going to touch that one because I can barely, you know, get a handle on the ones that I am already using. And so it's about understanding your audience as we've all sort of reinforced is understanding your audience and saying, well, where are they actually spending their time and how can I actually reach them effectively if your audience is only on YouTube and let's say only on Instagram then there's no need for you to be going and like create a Twitter account and a LinkedIn account or whatever it is like just just put those ones to the side and focus on the ones that you can actually reach your audience and and again it's about starting small it's about being consistent having those consistent actions and it's about quality over quantity sometimes we think that we have to be on these platforms all day you know sometimes we see people on YouTube, they're vlogging their whole life. We see people on Instagram stories all day. You don't have to do that. If that's your brand, if that's what you feel comfortable with, then absolutely. But you don't have to do that. And I always say it's better to have, you know, more of a quality presence and put out quality content. So if that means only putting out two or three posts per week, as opposed to just putting so many things out and it's not even that great, it's much better to go towards to go towards the quality. So don't feel overwhelmed by all the tools. Don't feel overwhelmed by having to show up all the time. Just think about how you can show up strategically and show up with quality content uh, that your audience will actually value and you can actually drive them to action uh, more importantly. Um, I agree with you on that one, uh, but I can try mm -hmm. and so, um, yes, as an artist, uh, I think if I were to uh, inspire any artists out there, I would say, first of all, remember you're an artist. <laughs> first mm -hmm. I remember that you know you're you know that the music is first and everything else comes with it right and then you just have to decide okay I know I have this wicked piece of music who who do I think would appreciate it and that's the first question you would ask yourself and keep it simple I echo what you say Chanel it, mm -hmm. so much um it's a content calendar plan planning is important you have 30 days or so in a month what are you going to post within that week and plan it two weeks ahead a month ahead so that you won't have to always be playing catch up, playing catch up and stressing yourself out. So you know that you take a free tool like, uh, is it Buffer or I have Hootsuite and I go on Hootsuite and my sister helps me a lot. And, and we, we plan it, we plan the posts and uh, it really, really helps to take away the stress so I can go back in the studio and do my songwriting and everything else that I do that I love. So you don't have to live on it. You just have to plan to live on it if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. I think there was an expression you used, Mark, about intensity. Do you mind repeating that again? Because some, a lot of that resonated, I believe, with, with our audience, certainly did with yes. me. Yes, yeah, so uh, from the book 48 Laws of Power, I believe it's Law 23, <laughs> to concentrate your forces. And one of the statements they say on this is that intensity beats extensity. So it's almost like you're drilling for oil and you're trying to drill for oil in multiple holes, it'd be better just to focus on one hole and drill very deep. You'll get mm -hmm. more of a reward from that. Now, I, this might be a tough question to ask guys, but are you seeing examples of success um, in terms of people going from the traditional world to the digital world and having success? Are you seeing solid examples of that? Are we still so early in the game at this point? Oh yeah, a local local artist, Dylan Ponders, hip hop, amazing talent. He was featured on uh, Spotify, millions of streams. Wow, he's making money from Spotify. Who makes money from Spotify from a grassroots level? But he put in the work. He has a team around him as well. Um, there's other artists. Uh, if we were to look at celebrated artists, of course, Cardi B started that way. Chance the Rapper. They translated what we did offline, online, because they, the consumer behavior, the artists and fan behavior went online. So they, we followed them or they followed us. Could be vice versa. All right. Um, I know Chance the Rapper really um, broke new ground because one of the things he refused to do, he didn't go to a label even though he could have gone to a label and decided that that was the lane that he wanted to operate in. Um, so yeah, nice to, to talk about success stories because they become inspirations for other people who are just now getting out of the blocks 
And as we're seeing, you know, on um, the first day of this event, we had Karen Allen talking about how there are people out there on Twitch easily making $50,000, $150,000 monetizing an audience of, let's say, 300, you know, fans that are there to support you. So, you know, um, it, it kind of at this moment um, is driven by singer songwriters, um, but that's not the only game. We're starting to see a lot of DJs who are infiltrating, if I can use that word, um, Twitch. And, you know, Chanel, you spoke about a favorite, new favorite DJ of mine in your presentation, D-Nice. Yeah. And D-Nice has become must listening in my household. Oh, okay, you know? yeah. <laughs> um, so that's something we share in common. And mm -hmm. if you haven't checked out D-Nice, here's a guy mm -hmm. who has been around for, I don't know, 25 years. Um, you know, came out of New York with a number of other DJs as well and um, had gotten to a point in his career as a DJ slash producer where he said he didn't want to go and spend at a club so people can buy, you know, bottles of champagne and that sort of thing. He wanted to be an opening act and aspired to be an opening act for a Jill Scott or artists like that. So rather than him being the background, he was now going to have more of an upfront role. And I think he's taken advantage of the pandemic like few people have. Um, I've seen as much as 10,000 people tuning in um, to his uh, DJ sets. Um, and so we're starting to see that movement on Twitch as well, where a lot of DJs, um, you know, are generating, you know, decent sums of money. I have a brother who spins on uh, Twitch and he was telling me the other day in about an hour, he was able to make about $300. Now, three, mm -hmm. three, $500 an hour, that has happened to him. Mm -hmm. And imagine the kind of income that you can generate with just using this as a side hustle, because mm -hmm. time is, is, is always the enemy here. Imagine doing that and imagine streaming three, four times a week for four hours a day. You know, I mean, it, it adds up. Mm -hmm. So that's yet another platform that I've seen that um, has really taken people to higher heights. And you know, now we see D Nice um, spinning for not just Barack Obama and Michelle Obama, but for Biden. And, you know, he's, he's uh, being hired to promote films. And mm -hmm. I think coming out of this, um, if he wanted, he could have his own show in Sirius FM, among other things. Absolutely. You know, the other one we never spoke about in this session is um, Versus. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. That's an incredible example. <laughs> um, how did Versus become so big? Can anybody speak on that? Because <laughs> to me, it's just amazing how that experience has blossomed into um, something that is one of the biggest success stories that we've seen um, mm -hmm. during the pandemic. Um, so it's, yeah. it, to me, what it does, it speaks to being creative it, it speaks of being in the moment. It speaks to experimentation. And uh, these guys have sold it um, to a company that competes with TikTok. And they're getting paid to get a, a share of the larger company while managing versus um, beyond just music, but in a number of other frames, sports and other things. So it just shows how a little bit of creativity can become not a side hustle, but the main hustle. You know what I mean? You Were you going to say something, Belinda? Yes, I was just adding to what you're saying. And I think with Versus, they, they looked at the, the three factors, which is the demographic, the, the audience, you know, who are they going to be um, executing this Versus show to? It was perfect, 10 out of 10, number two. 
geographically, it was global <laughs> because it's internet and a lot of the audience, the demographic were on Instagram, right? And then of course the psychographics, the people who liked that type of music. So all three great checklists, they won. And I thought that's why it was so popular. And it was the right time, everybody's at home. Yeah, you're not going out on a Saturday night anymore. So <laughs> that kind of captivated that, audience. That kind of work. Um, any last words? Because I think we're we're coming up uh, against. Um, we got about ten minutes left to go. Um, does anybody want to post any questions, or are you okay with just being part of a conversation? Um, I wanted to know, um, Mark. You talk about it from a business perspective and you talk about artists being their own businesses. Um, what kind of uptake are you seeing during the pandemic as someone who services the small business sector? Well, I've seen an uptake on definitely online, number of people that want to start online businesses, especially in the black community. It took off, especially after the George Floyd incident. A lot of people just said, you know what, I want to empower myself, empower my community and start my own business. So that skyrocketed. And then obviously uh, online education. So uh, some businesses are partnering, partnering online education with their business. Even the major enterprise companies, they're actually creating their own universities for students. Uh, the challenge for that I, I've seen happening a lot was uh, for new grads. So I see that small businesses are giving the new grads that are having a challenge finding roles. They're giving them an opportunity to uh, get, get experience. So that's right. kind of been the, the trend. Um, here's a question for Belinda. It says, it reads, what suggestions would you give to an upcoming artist who's just learning how to get out his or her music in the digital world, especially during this pandemic when your live performances are limited? Mm -hmm. That's part A and part B is, also, how do we get in touch with Belinda for singing in music classes? Mm -hmm. I follow her on Instagram and I know she has an academy. Is there contact information? Thank you. Um, again, I'm going to repeat myself. Be the artist first. Do what you love first. And if it's great, people will love it. Even if the, I learned that I didn't have to go to a record company for people to like my music. There is a grassroots, that if it's not a million people, there's 100,000 people, I'll take them, okay? I'll take 10,000 because guess what? Those 10,000, they're gonna appreciate what I do. And uh, so I wanna just reiterate that. Um, take your time in understanding the digital ecosystem because this is where we are now, right? The pointers are when you do your music, what do you do with it next? You need to release it out into the internet world are you going to go and it, uh, put it on itunes or spotify write down how you're going to do that because when you ask yourself how you will find the answers on the internet the second thing is as as uh, chanel says as mark says you have to understand that you can't go on all the platform then just choose a couple that you have the time for if it's just one to start with use one instagram right Learn it through and through. There are free courses on Instagram that you can take. There's lots of readings you can take. There's udemy.com. There's lynda.com. There's all kind of .com. It's called Google. <laughs> Learn it. Take your time. Even if it's one hour a day, 30 minutes a day, make it a consistent learning experience. I've been in marketing for over 20 years and I am still taking courses. Why? Because it's always changing. The landscape is always changing. Let's put yourself as a, as a music artist now. I hate to break it to you, don't you know, a marketer. So you have to, when you have that mindset, then that is how you will accept the new space that we're in. So you can do what you love and get appreciated for your, what you love. But let me add something here. And, you know, if you guys disagree, please, please say so. If you have a different opinion, please share it. Um, the sense I got from you earlier um, is not only do you want to be able to focus on your music as an artist, but, you know, there's an expression that goes teamwork makes the dream work. Yes. Um, which suggested that you had to 
create a team around you to help support you as an artist. Mm -hmm. Did I get that right? And how important is it, Chanel and Mark, and the other things that you guys uh, offer advice on? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, I think having a team is important, but I know in the beginning when you're getting started, it's hard to, uh, you know, bring people in. Maybe you don't necessarily have the funds to be able to bring people on. And it's only now that I've been sort of doing my speaking career and writing and whatnot for the last five years. It's only now that I'm really starting to build a team around that. In the beginning, it was just me, myself and I doing everything. I was writing the social media. I was blogging. I was posting. I was taking my own pictures. I was every role and doing everything. And it can be tough, but you know, as Belinda said, you just gotta learn. You gotta be able to take things on and do what you need to do because you wanna see yourself succeed. When you start to grow and you can start to build your team, then you can do that. But another way that you can, you know, when you get started is collaborations, you know, finding people that are also getting started and partnering with them because you can both sort of take advantage of your audiences, but also swap skills, right? You know what your strengths are, you know what your weaknesses are. Maybe you can collaborate with someone that has strengths in the areas where maybe you're a little bit weaker um, and you can do that. I did that a lot when I was getting started, you know, finding other people that are in the same field, talking about the same things, and maybe we'd partner and we'd have events together or we'd uh, do some social media collaborations and sharing each other's content. So there's always so many different creative ways that you can use other people. It's not necessarily always about having a team, but how can you use your network and your people and leverage that to continue to get yourself out there and your brand out there and get more opportunities? Uh, well said. Uh, Mark, do you have anything you want to add to that? Because yeah, just to touch on that. Like I think business as well, you, you probably need that kind of, you know, team spirit, that teamwork. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So I think starting out, you do, as it was said earlier, that you do have the tendency that you want to do everything for yourself, right? Do you, you know, I want to try and do everything, do it yourself, have it under control. And then it gets to a point where things start slipping through the cracks, you'll start noticing that, you know, things start slipping through the cracks. This is where, you know, you have to put your ego aside and get honest about what your weaknesses are, especially, right? And not being afraid to reach out for help. So same, same with business where you tell people to do your a SWOT analysis, where you're asking about your strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. I think artists can do that as well. It's, it's a business. And then you partner, not just because someone's your friend, because that's, that can be devastating, right? You just partner because someone's your friend is because you're going to partner based on your weaknesses again mm -hmm. and that they're strong where you are weak. And then that's where you kind of partner. So I, I think you shouldn't be afraid to ask for help, right? That, I think that's the most important thing, right? And there is sometimes people, you have to see that there is power in delegation. It, 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 it's there. There's power in, in managing a situation, having a vision, and then getting people to buy into it and working with you to get to your, to your vision uh, going together. I think a lot of times you want to do it yourself. Um, really, a lot of the times the fans only care about the end product. So it's not all about you doing it yourself. All right. So um, we're coming up against uh, the clock, and um, I don't see any additional questions. So... Um, let's take the opportunity at this point to thank all of you, Chanel, uh, Belinda, Mark, and Nikita, who had to go. I think this has been a really um, interesting, inspiring, invigorating conversation. And there's so much information here that um, I also want to say this, that we're going to be posting um, these Zoom uh, sessions um, on the website for people who want to go through it again. Uh, there might be particular segments um, throughout this hour and a half that you want to go and listen to a second time, you know, and as you heard there, someone has already uh, asked the question of Belinda. Belinda, I don't know if you want to put your, any of your socials in the chat for people wanting to sign up with you. Um, you know, or, or Mark or Chanel, um, all of you guys have been very dynamic. And I'm sure that um, as a friend of mine used to say, if you're not linking, you're not thinking. So please take full advantage of the opportunity to link with these uh, experts. And uh, again, thank you very much for being a part of this. Um, we are going to continue uh, next week, Tuesday, with um, 
a session on um, recording at home like a pro. Um, in this pandemic era, you know, not only are we seeing more people recording at home, but that was already a shift given the technology and the opportunity for people to record um, from their basement or from their bedrooms or whatever the case might be. So um, we've got a couple of professional uh, studio guys who are gonna be running that session and it's being done in association with the Mississauga Arts Council. Um, and uh, we're looking forward to doing more collaborations with them as well. And I think for those of you who want, you know, to get a one-on-one on that, um, there's your opportunity to do that. We also have, and I'll just quickly add a few um, notes here. We also have next week, Wednesday, we have a session called, it's a panel discussion, Overcoming Challenges Faced by BIPOCs in the Music Industry. Um, you know, I think that question, that session speaks for itself. Um, it's challenging, it's hard work, it's ingenuity, it's connections, it's all of the above and more. So I think there's gonna be a very exciting discussion there. We have Courtney Uno, uh, an artist manager, Demetrius Nath, who runs his own company and is in charge of MississaugaMusic.com. We also have Bushra Janaid, who is an OEC grants officer, and she runs a, a division called Skills and Career Development for those of you in the music industry that might be interested in that. She'll have some more. And we have um, David Click Cox, who um, runs his company Click Creative and manages a pretty diverse roster of artists. So that's next week, Wednesday. And then um, we have a funding panel, which is always one of the more popular ones. And in these times, artists, please pay attention because if you haven't been paying attention, one of the things emerging out of this pandemic is that, you know, the government funding agencies have recognized that they need to support artists through this downturn. Um, artists are one of the hardest hit groups uh, with no performance opportunities and, um, you know, very little, you know, um, little to no opportunities at all to do gigs or to do festivals. Um, so it's a discussion you definitely want to be a part of. And we have uh, Dwayne Dixon from Ontario Arts Council. We have Anthony Johnson from Factor. We have Aisha Wickham from Ontario Creates. And we have Corey Poole, who's a music officer from the city of Mississauga. So lots to um, absorb and hopefully you can make good use of it. And so we look forward to you joining us the next time around. Thank you very much, guys. Much appreciated. Peace, love, stay safe, and we'll see you next time. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.